this became for John a special teaching technique of Jesus Christ using the Hebrew amen, amen, which was translated in King James verily, verily, and translated in the English, the New American English, uh, truly, truly. But really, it is the Hebrew word amen, and he took a Hebrew concept of doxology of important doctrinal principles of dispensational thinking, and he turned it in to a special method for teaching important messianic doctrines, doctrines that would be really important for the Jewish nation to understand that Jesus is the Christ, the long-looked-for Messiah. And so uh, John records uh, 25 of such declarations that Jesus gave Israel. You say to me, well, Ron, I wonder why that was important. Well, for John, they were declarations that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So for John, that was an important message that Israel rejected. Uh, and it kind of staggering, I suppose, to John. So out of, uh, out of 11 chapters of 21 in the book of John, John records these. There are 25 of them that he records, and we're studying them. Sometimes he puts them in series. He won't just give you one. He might give you three or four in a passage. Uh, that means there, that one is spinning off another and another. In other words, if you see this about Christ, look for this about Christ, and then look for this about Christ. And um, we have such a thing in John 5. In John the 5th, so we're walking through the book of John looking for these things. We're on a scavenger hunt looking for truly, truly, I say unto you. And we're looking for those important doctrines. We saw it in the first chapter, the third chapter. We have one, in, one of them in chapter 1, then chapter 3 with Nicodemus. Now we're in chapter 5. And he gives us three Verse 19, 24, and 25 are three. Just look down there right away. Look down right away, and we'll have a word of prayer. But look down. You'll have your Bibles open to John 5, right? All right, or your cell phone flipped open to it, one of the two. Uh, and in verse 19, we have truly, truly, I say to you. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say unto you. Verse 25, truly, truly, I say unto you. Agreed? And he taught, he taught three, and they're all connected. Now, what's interesting about this is the passage in study are 30 verses. Chapter 5, verse 1 through 30 is what we call the context of what is going on. That's the big context. And when you study the 30 verses, you will see that they were broken into three sections. For example, in the fifth chapter, and we have talked about this, Fifth chapter, verses 1 through 15, Jesus does a healing. You remember that? At a Passover festival. John records four Passovers in the, in the ministry of Christ. He's the only writer who does it, and it's really important for some of us that care about that uh, because it extends Jesus' ministry out there pretty good ways, and that's pretty good. Um, so he, he records this healing of this invalid for, 30, remember, 38 years. He heals them on a Sabbath of a Passover. And, of course, it, it drove the legalistic Jews nuts. Now, not because they were students of the Word of God, but it drove them nuts because they weren't a student of the Word of God. They were a student of their own handbook called the elders, the tradition of the elders, a supplement to the Word of God that became more important to them than the Word of God itself. Because when the word of God showed up, they rejected him. Come on now, John, the first chapter opens up. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and that's a good point that John is making through his own book. What happened with the Jews? He came to his own. His own didn't receive him. In fact, they rejected him. In fact, they murdered him. So he talks about this in the first. Then in ver the second section is verses 16, 17, and 18 when we have the religious Jews bringing charges against him. Now, now listen to me. Now, the third section of this section of 30 verses 
is verses 19 through 30. Where he now gets into discussion, truly, truly, I say to you. Verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you. Verse 25, he says, truly, truly, I say to you. You understand? He pops three great messianic doctrines. The one thing all three of those have in common to the context of the passage. Now listen to me. This is important. Is that the Father and the Son are one. There's equality. There is absolute 100% equality in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Though they are three persons, they are identical in essence. Inequality. And when you study this, you're going to see that, and it drove the Jews nuts. They, they, they call that blasphemy when you say you have equality with God. And they brought two charges against Jesus in verses 16, 17, and 18. They brought two charges against him. First charge was he healed a man on the Sabbath. They gave the man a ticket, and they want to kill Jesus. The second charge is very interesting because they say it. They say that he makes himself equal with God. And he did. All over the book of John, there's one theme. The Father and I are one. And you're going to see it in this passage. The theme behind all the, the primary message behind Truly, truly, I say to you in verse 19. Truly, truly, I say unto you in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say unto you in verse 25. The theme of the message is equality with God. And he gives you three different views of it in 19, 24, and 25. Now, we've studied 24, 19, and 24. Today, we're going to study 25. When he gets to 25... He does something really interesting. Now, you and I, we study the first coming and the second coming of Christ. The Jews didn't because there was no gap between the first and second coming to the Jew. The Old Testament didn't teach that. The church is the gap between the first coming and the second coming, and that was a mystery. So they only think of the coming of Christ as one event. Jesus is going to explain to them the difference between the first coming and the second coming and that his identity with God won't change either time. I am equal with God. The Father and I are one in the first coming. The Father and I are equal in the second coming. In our verses 25 and 26 today, he's going to talk about the first coming. In verses, now listen to me now. In verses 27, 28, 27 through 30, he's going to talk about the second coming of Christ, equality with God. And so today I'm going to talk about verse 25. Verse 25 is the truly, truly I say unto you that goes all the way to 30. And in that he talks about the coming of Christ. But remember, the Jews didn't understand the first coming and second coming. We are the only ones that talk that way. Are you with me? We're the only ones. You, they didn't talk, Jews didn't think that way, even in Jesus. His disciples couldn't put their, wrap their head around that idea. They struggled all the way to Pentecost with that idea. So let's have a word of prayer. Then we're going to get into this study today. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there and, such, and, and as such has made your body uniquely different in the eyes of God? It is now the temple, the naos of God, a place where God dwells and moves among his people. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in your life, you're a spiritual person, but you could be carnal carnal is because you still have a sin nature you still have volition you still live in the world and you can still commit sin 
How do I know if it's sin? Well, the Bible tells you what sin is. That's the purpose of the law, to identify sin in your life and a Savior that the only one that can remove it. So you can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of tongue and avert sins. And of course, how do I get rid of it and get back to be this spiritual person through the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Well, you confess your sin. You do it through your priesthood according to 1 Peter 2, and you do it according to 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's how you study the Bible. That's not only how you learn it, that's how you live it. You live it in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of the word of God by faith. I give you that moment. To examine personal sin in your life, you're, the respons you're responsible for it. When you confess it, you are once again restored to fellowship as a ministry of sanctification, spiritual sanctification in your life, experiential. How thankful we are today, Father, for these who have come our way to study with us both by the automobile and by the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God in the third truly, truly in this passage of John 5, that is so important to the messianic thinking. Jesus wasn't, wasn't born in Nazareth as declared. He was a resident. It was his mailing address. He was born in Bethlehem, according to the scriptures. Nobody but a few were willing to look into that like the outsiders, like the Magi who come to town. They didn't go to Nazareth. They went to the birthplace of Jesus. And the Jew knew that was a birthplace because he could look it up on record. These were records kept by the Jews and kept by the Romans. And the Jews better keep them or the Romans would get them. This is not heresy. This is not guessing. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, mailing address in Nazareth, has got to prove himself through his birth and identity with Christ in the way he lives to be the Messiah. And this is what this passage is about today, Father, and I pray the Holy Spirit would minister it to our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, We're looking at the fact that John is going to use this phrase, truly, truly, in a sequence. He's going to do it in verse 19. He's going to do it in verse 24 and 25. And that's significantly important to what's going on, the context, the first 30 verses, as I've mentioned that to you in my introduction. Three messianic doctrines that I'm going to divide in two sections. Because verse 24, 5 and 26 deals with the first coming and verses 27 through 30 deal with the second coming. And listen to me now. Two things really important in this, in the first coming and second coming, that's identified in this, verily, verily, I say unto you in verse 25, that the hour of Messiah is going to bring the voice of Messiah and the voice of Messiah is going to raise the dead to life. That's going to be true in the first coming. That's going to be true in the second coming. Only you and I think that way. So when he says it to these people, they understood that the voice of the Messiah would raise the dead. They didn't understand that there was going to be a separation between the first coming and the second coming. Do you understand that? It's important you understand it. Half the church don't know this stuff. It's important that you know this stuff. Otherwise, you'll never understand a passage like this. This is so screwy in most people because they don't understand this. Okay. So we're looking today at verses 25, 26, next Sunday, we're going to look at 27, 28. We're going to look 27 through 30. 
Today we deal with the first coming Christ, and we're talking about his hour, and we're talking about his voice, and we're talking about the Messiah's life. Notice, as we look at verse 25 and 26 in your Bibles, you see I've made this outline for you. Well, I, we, I wrote it on your paper. Look at point number one. We're going to examine verses verse uh, 25 and 26. I better look. I don't know if I wrote both of them or not. John 5. Let me get my text. John 5. Here's 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is. Yeah. Hour is coming and now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so, I can't tell you how important that two little phrases are. Just as, even so. That's where you get equality. Just as, even so. Just as the Father has life, that's eternal life, that's the only kind of life God has in him. For just as the Father has eternal life, divine life in himself, even so... He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself. That's eternal life. Are you with me? Watch this. Keep your place. Now, He said that in John 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. It's passed out of... Right there? But watch this. Now, watch it. Watch what verse 25 says. The Father has eternal life in Himself... Even so, he gave to the Son also to have eternal life in himself. Do you understand that? Eternal life is the only life God has. Okay. Now, once you go to 1 John, because John writes it, the same writer, which is important on this subject. In 1 John 5, watch this, 11, 12, and 13. The witness is this. The witness. The witness in verse 11 and 12 is recorded as written. Now watch this. Look at verse 11. The witness is this. And then he describes the witness in verse 11 and 12. And then he says in verse 13, These things involved in the witness I have written to you. Okay? Now let's see what what the witness was that should be recorded. Here it is. The witness is this, that God has given us, that the believer in Jesus Christ, we believe that he died for our sins, we were buried and raised from the dead third day. These things I've written to you who believe, uh, these things uh, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Do you see that? You know why John says that? as an afterthought, because it was a pre-thought. It was a forethought. In our passage it is, right? John goes on. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These are the things, the witness, these are the things of the witness that I have written and recorded to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you know you have eternal life? Because John said, if you believe in the Son, that he came to die on a cross for your sins, buried and raised from the dead, that's why he came to the earth. That's why he came to the earth. Jesus said, I came to the earth to seek and to save that which is lost. I came into the world to save sinners. So, see, we understand this passage. We understand this. We understand this. So, back to John. Back to John 5, 25 and 26. Truly I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live, shall live, 
just as the Father has given life in himself, has life, has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Then he goes on to another subject, which is the second coming for you and I. Notice my title of my lesson is The Messiah's Hour. He says three things here, for me at least, in verse 25, 26. He says there is a messianic hour. There's an hour in the life of Christ in the world. As a, listen, there's no hours in eternal life. You don't need your watch when you get to heaven. You need it on earth. Hours and days and years is earth stuff. That comes right out of Genesis, the creation story. Seasons and days and years and calendars and An hour is coming, that's, that's prophetic. The hour is coming and now is here. Both of these, the word coming and is now, both of those words are present active indicatives. That which we have looked for, the Messiah is coming. But it's the Messiah's hour, you right? It's not the coming it's the hour that John is focused on. He said Jesus kept focusing on his hour. He said he kept talking about an hour, an hour, an hour. Hours are coming, hours will go. And he said, We're, I'm talking about an hour is coming. The hour is coming. It's not yet. We'll see that in a moment. And then all of a sudden, it's here. The hour is coming. It is the purpose, that hour is the purpose. What is the purpose in Christ coming into the world? Whatever that is, that's his hour. And hour is coming and now is. That's a, look, you know what the hour coming is? That's eternity past. That's eternity past. You know what, where the hour is now is? The hour now is? That's historical present. That's a, one present one present tense is an is an eternal past is a past past even though it's in a present tense of its now activated in human history but it comes out of the past and the other present tense is a historical present. Just kind of interesting way to to do that, and that's his purpose in it. And and this is a declaration. It, you can't see it in your English Bible, but when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, there is a hote, it's a declarative conjunction that covers the whole subject. This is a declaration, a declaration. An hour is coming, and now is, he says, when the dead, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Let me show you why that's first coming, not second coming. Do you see that voice? And the dead shall hear and, and come to life. Yeah, are you with me? Drop down to verse 28. See, most people don't, they don't read the Bible enough to pay any attention to how it was written. Verse 28, do, my, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice. Now watch this, verse 29. And shall come forth those who did good deeds to the resurrection of the life and those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. You know what that is? That's second coming. That's the difference between the first resurrection and the second resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the condemned. Now, if you've, if you've spent any time with us, you know that. Now, so there's the Messianic, but the Messianic voice in 2425 is dealing with the historical present, not the historical future. Now, you and I know this because we know the church age sits in the, in the space between the first and second coming of Christ. And I'm going to explain to you today, when the dead shall hear, his vo shall hear the voice of the Son of God, how important that is. This is based on justification. This is 
when we're talking about this dead hearing the voice of Christ and coming to life, we're talking about, and we're not talking about a spiritual dead like in Adam. We're talking about physical. Physical. And it's going to be a sign of Messiah to raise the dead. It's going to be a sign of Messiah. It's a sure enough sign. He's going to do all these different things as signs to Israel. 1 Corinthians 1.22. Sign to Israel that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the Savior of the world. So in Romans 4.25, what we're talking about is justification. He was raised for our justification. That's a very important principle to this idea. When it, what This voice that he's talking about here is a voice that raises the dead as a sign to Israel, not the second coming that's a sign to the world. When there will be two resurrections. Okay? The first and the second business. Then he talks about the Messiah's life, eternal life that I just talked about. And those who hear shall live, for just as the Father has life in himself, so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. He had that before he died on the cross. As well as after. And before you leave here today, I'll prove it to you. Okay? That's my job. Here's the second point. Here's the second point. As Jesus' ministry became more public in Israel, the more the doctrinal concept of the Messianic hour. For example, in the first miracle that John performed, you remember the wedding miracle at Cana? Remember that one? The wedding? Listen to, listen to what it says. Here is John. Here is Jesus. Here is John recording that first miracle, and he records an important statement made between Jesus and his mother that he overheard. It's recorded in John, the second chapter, verse 4. Jesus says to his mother, My hour has not yet come. In the John, the second chapter, verse 11, it records that this miracle done at the wedding, this is the beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. The miracle was a sign. He called it his hour. My hour has not yet come. It's here, but it's not ready to be manifested. It's, it, and so what he did in the first miracle is he manifested it, but he's got more to show. This phrase, not yet, is recorded by John in the 7th chapter, verse 30, in the 8th chapter, verse 20. Not yet come. The hour, the hour is coming and is now present. The New American Standard Bible footnote on John 8.20 records, the hour for manifesting himself as Messiah had not yet come. In other words, the manifestation. It's, in, it's here because Christ is in the world. His ministry has now just come into blossom. He declares his hour is here. Now it's about manifesting that because his hour is not going to come until he hangs on that cross, is buried on the third day, raised from the dead. In case that's a gate question. Do you know what the biggest sign Jesus... Now, he gave him all these signs. He, he healed... He raised from the dead. He did all this kind of stuff, right? I mean, he did knock it out of... And listen, we only... Listen, if, 
listen, the apostle said if we wrote everything that he did, you, the libraries would be filled. You couldn't walk around with one book. You'd have to have a truck, a library truck. <laughs> Do you know what his biggest miracle? Do you know what his biggest, what his biggest sign to Israel was? Well, he said it in Matthew 12, 28 through 40. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale, in the belly of the whale. Even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. And then guess what? Out of the grave he arose. hoo -ah. The greatest sign to Israel that he was the Christ, that he would rise from the dead. And listen, it took that for even his disciples to go like, oh, I finally get it. I finally get it. There's a, there's a cross before the crown. I finally get it. There's a tree before the throne. Oh, I finally get it. I don't know. The greatest sign is recorded in Matthew. He told him that. He told him that. He told him that. Here's the third point. In Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane and the great prayer, Jesus prayed to his father. Here's what he said. Recorded by Mark in 1435. He said, if possible, let the hour pass by me. You know how we usually interpret that? The cup. Because he said that as well. We normally say, Father, if possible, let the cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done, right? Mark records that in this conversation in Gethsemane, he talks about his hour in which he must drink the cup of the sins of the world. In John, the 12th chapter, verse 23, it's going to be declared, the hour has come. You know where you are in John 12? This is, this is what people miss. When he says, the hour has come, I hear Big Ben, I hear Big Ben, Dong, dong, dong. That's the clock going. In John 12, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He says again in chapter 1632 and 171, You know why? Because you're at the you're in the last you're in the upper room at the Last Supper. He's about to listen, he's about to go to the cross. And he says, first he says, the hour is coming, the hour is. Then he says, the hour is not yet, but it's being manifested. The hour's not yet, but it's being manifested. The hour's not yet, but but it's being manifested. It's a coming, it's a coming. It's a coming. You see all the cloud of dust and the high old silver? It's a coming. It's a coming. It's a coming. And then he says at the Last Supper, it is here. The hour has come. And what you see in Gethsemane is what he talks about in John 12, 27. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. You see that? Out of all the tests that Jesus Christ went through in his life, this is the biggie. Because this one will separate him from God, who he's never been separated for, ever, eternally. 
He has never been separated from the Father eternally. And he's going to be separated from the Father eternally. This is the Father, comes, this is the Father and Son relationship that comes out of eternity past. Before the foundation of the earth. Before the foundation of the earth. You and I can't imagine what that means. There's no way you could possibly imagine what that means. And people come and go out of your life. They, you, you, you miss them for a while and then you, you push on if you're healthy. You get on with your life. Because everything's temporal. Nothing's eternal. But you're talking about something that's eternal. My God, my God, why have you ever said, you know what he's talking about? He's not talking about human. He's talking about divine relationship. That's my opinion. That's a, that's, that's a God talking to God. I don't know if you can grasp that, but it's well worth grasping in this hour. My soul is troubled, he said, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. That's what my heart feels, Father. That's what my heart feels. My, my heart is troubled. And on the one hand, I want to say, oh, I don't want to experience not being with you one moment of my time. But for this hour to come to purpose, I've got to be separated from you. And listen, separation one second away from the Father would have been an eternity for him. See, I don't know that we understand all the loss that Christ had when he died on the cross for our sins. And maybe we can grasp a little bit of it in our finite mind, just a little bit of the suffering that he was worried about going through. The suffering of sin was far from the suffering his soul anticipated losing, according to him. In Mark, the 14th chapter, in verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, you can see how this mean, what this means to him. Listen, you and I can't call God Abba, Father, until we're adopted through the blood of Christ. Who are? Uh, he called him Abba, Father, because he's, he's always been his daddy. He's talking about in eternity past he was his daddy. That God was his daddy. In the flesh, that even is more meaningful to him. In his flesh, Abba Father is very meaningful to him. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And that's become probably one of the most famous lines from Christ on the cross ever spoken in it, or out of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 45, at Gethsemane with his disciples. Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. You know who these hands of sinners were? This is an interesting term, sinner, because sinner is used a lot of different ways in the Bible. These Jews, these religious Jews referred to sinners that didn't ascribe to the handbook of their of pharisaical legalism. They called all those people who didn't embrace, they called them sinners. They called them sinners. And they got mad at Jesus because that's who he went for. The lost, the perishing. But you know who these are? These are Jews who are doing the dirty work for the religious legalist. These are Jews. They come out and arrested him. You know where they took him? They didn't take him to Rome. You know where they took him? They didn't take him to the Roman, 
They did take her to the Roman jurisdiction. Do you know where they took him? They took him to Je the Jewish high priest. This is as bad as it gets in a nation. These were Jews doing the dirty work for other Jews who wouldn't soil their hands because it would make them sinners, but they didn't mind throwing their brothers under the bus. Legalism. Stay out of legalism. It gets this dirty and bad. They thought, listen, they would hire these people to do their dirty works so that they could stay, quote, right with God. And they would buy people off to kill people and to do things. I mean, how corrupt is that? Point number four, the, the Messiah's hour was prepared, or we would say decreed. The Messiah's hour was prepared or decreed at the Eternal Life Conference, that's in eternity past, by the sovereignty of God. That's why it's decreed. When the, the sovereignty speaks, it's a decree. That's what I mean by that. Here is 1 Peter 1, 20, 21. It gives you that information. For he was foreknown, talking about the, the Christ. We know Jesus Christ. Jesus is the historical person of the prophetic Christ. We will call his name Jesus, for he will say, but he's Christ. We'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, circle the word before, but has appeared in these last times, watch, for the sake of you. Think about that. Now, that's why he, that's why he came into the world. He came into the world for you and for me. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these times of human history for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. That's a hua. Look at Ephesians 1.4. Just as God chose us in him, that's the doctrine of election, just as he chose us in him, election is all about Christ, not about you. It's all about Christ. The word chose is the word elect. It's all about, it's all about Jesus, not about you. People make it about you. It's not about you. It's about him. He chose us where? In him. If you're in him, you're what? Chosen. This is not complicated. People try to make too much out of the human side of it, not enough out of the divine side of it, and they get confused. Just as he chose us in him before, look at that, before the foundation of the world. How was that determined? Everybody who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ enters into him, and into him he's, he has the in him blessings positional before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless before him you know what that is that's about how we live you can't live holy and blameless apart from in Christ and when you do that's been designed for your life in eternity past at the conference center Here's Ephesians 1.7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's all about grace. Listen, it's never about you. It's never about works. It's all about Christ. And it's all about grace. 
And your life will get a lot simpler if you remember that. You make way too much out of nonsense rather than sense. Here's John 17, 24, the upper room discourse just before he goes to the cross. Father, I desire that they also watch this prayer. Let me tell you, this prayer can be answered in your life. Well, you, listen, you, you ask anything according to the will of God, he hears you, he hears you, gives it to you. How much more of the son? You think he wasn't right on the money? Well, here's a prayer right on the money for you. Got your name on it. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given to me be with me where I am. You know where that is? Hmm. It's in your text. Look in your text and tell me where he is. What, where, where's this prayer directed? Well, it's apparently going to be a gate question. <laughs> so that they may see my glory, which you have given me for, watch this, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. There it is. The love of God. You enter into the love of God that will never leave you nor forsake you because you had the good sense to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day to give you eternal life and to bring you into a love relationship. Listen to me now. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you have loved me. That's what the glory he wants you to see by being involved in his life. And I'm going to tell you the hallmark of spiritual mature believer is his capacity to love others in spite of any conditions involved in it. We're so petty. Oh, we want to be forgiven to the last ounce. We won't forgive the first one. You will when you reach maturity. One of your signs of need for growth, the need for more consistent Bible study, is how you handle conflict, how you deal with people who are in the family of God, and you know it, how you deal with conflict with these people in the family of God. I'll tell you, the Lord put that on my heart one day a few years ago, not many either, but a few years ago when he laid that on me. And I thought to myself, well, I'm doing pretty good. And he went, oh, yeah, well, what about this? Who about, how about this person? And I went, well, that's different. And he went, no, no. <laughs> then he, I went, well, okay, I didn't do very good with that. I give you that one. But I'm pretty good now. I, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what about this one? Well, they kind of had it coming to them. <laughs> what do you mean they had it coming to them? I took all the having coming to them. That was what I did on the cross. I took all that coming to them business. Who are you coming to? Well, they had it coming to them. Listen, all the, all the coming to them, I, got, I took care of at the cross, buddy. Then I thought to myself, thinking he couldn't hear me. <laughs> I wonder how many more he's got a list of. I think I'll just shut up and get out of here. I don't think I want to challenge anymore. And so he just kept blabbering. What about this person? What about that person? What about this person? What about that person? There couldn't be that possibly that many people. That's more people than I got in my church. He went, yeah. Duh. So let me tell you, 
what I'm telling you is not just for your good, it's for my good. Because I have to eat this for lunch. Sometimes it's crow. <laughs> I don't know if you've eaten crow much. Better off having Jim and Nick's. <laughs> now, I want to show you where my lesson is, talking about the voice of the Son of God. The dead can hear and live. Are you with me? And it pertains to the first coming in this passage. We'll deal with the second coming next Sunday. The Messianic hour of the first advent involved the dead hearing the voice of the Son of Man and living. I love this one in Luke, the seventh chapter. Nobody writes like Luke when there's somebody dying. <laughs> that doctor really wrote. He gave you details you didn't really care about. But in Luke, the seventh chapter, 17 through 19, Jesus enters a little city called Nine. And there's a funeral progression going on. So like all people, you park. In the old day when I was a kid, you got out beside the car and took your hat off and put it over your heart when a funeral went by. That's the way my grandpa did. We parked on the side of the road, got out, and paid respect. I don't know if you could do that. Today you get run over by, you may not be able to get back in your car, but in that day there was respect. So he shows respect. He watched the progression. goes on. And then comes the, the casket. They're carrying the casket. And the mother behind it. She's a widow, and that's her only son. This means she's in bad, bad shape. This is Naomi. You know what I mean? Out of the old dad. This is Naomi. Weeping. And the Bible says the Lord looked at the casket and looked at the mama, and his heart went out to her. This poor widow with an only son. He stopped the procession. And said, young man, rise up. <laughs> up from the casket he rose. Here's how a guy like me thinks. I wonder if she could get her money back on that casket. <laughs> Would they consider that a used casket? Would that be now half price to give it back? What can I tell you? Listen to me. You think that man, you think that young man was in the casket? You think that, no, the body's there. Where do you think the young man is? Paradise. He's in paradise. He's, he's in the heart of the earth. There's a body in the casket. But when he heard the voice of the Son of Man, when he heard the voice of the Son of God, say, young man, arise. He arose from Sheol. Usually, Jesus spoke the name so we didn't have a bunch of people coming up. I don't know how that one worked. 
in Luke, the eighth chapter, there's the voice of the Son of Man to the living, dead to, the li to life. In the, probably one of the famous ones is in Luke 8, 40, 56 through 40, 30, 40 through 56. Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, only daughter, 12 years old, is dying. They sent for Jesus. And Jesus is, along with his disciples, hurrying on their way to the house. When the, the progression stops because a woman with a blood disease of 12 years has grabbed a hold of him in his dark garment and he stops the hole and says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I have just felt the power of God leave my life. Virtue. Somebody just touched me. The disciples went like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Somebody touched you? Look, I've had my hand over my bill for, for the last, a last mile. <laughs> I've, had, I've slapped three hands. And you want to, somebody touched your hip? Off your garment. I wish that's all they touched to me in this group. And so she says it was me. And, is a, and they're about ready to go again. And somebody says, there's no sense bothering him anymore. Your daughter's dead. The man touches Christ and says, there's no reason to go. No reason to go. That's the only reason to go. See, it's who you're talking to. If you're talking to a rabbi, then there's no reason to go. If you're talking to a prophet, there may be no reason to go. But if you're talking to the Son of God, there's a reason to go. Who are? You don't know who you're talking to. So there's every reason. There's more reason to go now than there ever was. And he speaks her out of the out of the grave, out of Sheol, back to life. Is she gonna die again? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know why? Because he hasn't been raised from the dead yet. None of this, all of this is going on. He hasn't been, he hasn't died on a cross. In John, the 11th chapter, probably the most famous of all, in John, the 11th chapter, verses 38 through 44, we have Lazarus of this wonderful, beloved family of Jesus Christ. He gets there, listen, he waits four days so that the body would... We're talking about the heat of the summer and decay. And he shows up, and they go like, well, well I wish you to come earlier. You could, we could have prevented all this. All of what? Well, Lazarus is dead. Well, who do you think I am? Who do, who do, you, th who, who do you think I am? Oh, I know you're the best teacher I've ever sat under. You're the best brother. I, you're a good man. I love you, and you're a best friend. And I expected my best friend to be here on my worst day. I am here as your best friend on your worst day. To show you that I am more than a good friend. I am more than a teacher. I am the son of God. I am the resurrection and the life. Come forth, Lazarus. Boom. Where do you think he came from? CEO. You think you think anybody believes that he's the son of God? Do you think anybody? Well, I bet Lazarus did. Huh? Don't you know that was an experience? Going and coming. 
That's quite a deal. But here's the big one. Here's the big one, and we're going to close on this one. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 27. I love this story. I've been writing a book on this for about, I don't know. I'm afraid to ask Jane how long I've been writing on this. A long time, back when she was my top secretary. She says, you know what? You, start, you have these great ideas. You start all these books. You get halfway through them. And then we stop. And, I, and she'll look back and she said, I said, oh, I don't know that. So she said, well, listen, the last time we wrote anything in this book was three years ago. <laughs> I thought it was like yesterday. But I, I, I'm writing a book on this. I'm writing a book on uh, Luke 16, too, when a guy says he's got five brothers at home. I, I, write, I, I know the names of those five brothers. They're the Schultz boys. I grew up with them. <laughs> and I'm having a good time writing about those five guys. Well, anyhow, I'm in 27. I'm in verse 50. After Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, that he's on the cross. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, earthquake, and the rocks, the rock, that's tomb doors. That is, tomb doors are split. And the tombs of certain believers, saints, opened. And many of the body of the saints who had fallen asleep during the ministry of Christ these are believers. These are believers that had been followers of Christ and died. Fallen asleep. See, saints fallen asleep. Came out of the tomb after, after, that's important now, after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The warp mind I have, I've been writing on the different people that they showed up at their door and knocked on. People, for example, I have one guy who owed this guy money and thought after he died he didn't have to ever pay it back. You owe me $500, I need that now. You think that guy wouldn't get that $500? I bet he sold his horses, cows, and cattle, and a couple kids to pay this guy that he was at the funeral and thought, that's the best $500 I'd ever had to pay. I write about that. This is the guy who wouldn't want at my door as I got him at somebody else's. Tombs were open, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they enter and appeared to many. You know how that happened? Heard the voice of the Son of Man. Next week, I'm going to talk about the voice that actually is going to, when he says it, everybody is going to be raised. The next voice. The second coming of Christ, when his voice shouts, and for all the unbelievers, and all the unbelievers come out, in the second resurrection, the resurrection of the condemned, stand before their great white throne judgment. You're going to listen to the voice of Christ one way or the other. You might as well get saved and have the good hearing. Be part of the good people, the good hands people. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, These are stories that are just, as unbelievers, this would be too far out for them. But as believers, this is everyday stuff. What was Jesus doing? Just fulfilling his role, trying to show Israel that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, that he had come to take away their sins so that they would have life and have it more abundantly and die with that abundantly forever. I mean, 
Thank you for sending him. Thank you, Father, that he followed the course and completed the mission so that we could be saved by grace and not of ourselves. It would be a gift. What an amazing grace. How sweet the sound. We love that vo inner voice in our own heart through the Holy Spirit that speaks the truth to us until one day we hear that voice of Christ himself. When the church will be raptured, we will sit and we'll listen to that voice call the dead, either for judgment or for righteousness. And we will be thankful that we were saved by grace and through faith and not of ourselves. It was a gift. In Jesus' name, amen.